reason I can't hardly talk or sing, so I've drafted my two daughters to help. <laughs> so we'll sing from the overhead, Jehovah Jairus and Awesome God, as we stand and sing. we pray, I want to look at Psalm 91 real quick. It says this, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to spend time in your word. We pray for those this morning that are here, that this would be an excellent opportunity as we look into the scripture together to be encouraged. Lord, we pray for the many prayer requests that are in hearts and minds this morning. Uh, we think of school as it's back in session, so we pray that you'd be with those that are teaching and those that are in attendance, that you would just work there. We think of also uh, here in our church as a one beginning uh, in September, that you would just help us to be equipped to um, carry the gospel into a dark generation. Lord, we think of others that are dealing with, with physical challenges. We pray for Paula. She has some more tests as she moves forward with her treatment. Thank you for the good report. There's good options that they have at this point. We pray it should be for those that are looking for jobs, that you would open doors for them, and those also dealing in, in very difficult situations at this time, that you would just encourage and undertake for them. Lord, we think also as we look to the future of the November elections that are coming up, that your will would be done there, and that you would work in the hearts and lives of those that are leading our country. We pray for others that deal with ongoing health issues like Terry Cobble and Arita Burnham, and for those with cancer like Bob Burnus and Lee Rowe, that you'd be with them. We pray for those that deal with ongoing physical conditions like Don and Suzanne and Della and Beth and others, that you would just give them the grace that they need. And Lord, for others that have uh, spiritual and physical needs in our church family, and also for those that will be traveling soon, returning from um, birthday celebrations here, that you would just give them safety as they go back to where they came from. Lord, we pray for our missionaries of the month, David and Lois Martin there as they, they minister uh, in Jordan and as they've had much to do this uh, last few months here stateside and as, as they uh, work on educating for time and eternity. Lord, we pray that you would undertake for them. Pray also for Pastor Varner as he's ministering down in Savenberg this morning at a church down there that you would just give him safety on the road and also a sweet time with that church. Lord, we pray that things that we say and do would honor and glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, may be seated. Good to see you all here uh, this morning, and also uh, welcome to all the Burnhams who are here. Um, so we, we've had a lot of October, no, it's not October, it's August. I don't know. I mean, I skipped entirely over September and went straight to October. 
A lot of August birthdays. Uh, the twins had some just the other day, and there is a birthday today. And I am disappointed that you're not wearing the crown this morning. Um, I wanted to see that. But he does have a, a I'm ringing, I think. He does have uh, the button on. Is that that thing? I'll back up from it. Uh, he does have his button on. So um, I have been tasked with leading a song this morning. I don't have as pretty helpers as you do. So we're going to sing happy birthday. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ralph. Happy birthday to you. I always wonder how different people end that song because my kids get the cha 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 hi ya in there, but they refrained themselves this morning. So happy birthday uh, to you, Ralph, this morning. Uh, that's why we've got balloons everywhere, so um, glad to see your family here and you've got some helpers to help you sing this morning. Uh, by way of announcements, uh, we have our regular activities this morning, our morning service. We have our evening service this evening, which is it's an evening service. And then we have our teen Bible study at 6.30 on Wednesday, and then our Bible study and prayer time at 7 o'clock for the adults at that time. Uh, potluck, the sign-up sheet is on the bulletin board. That is next Sunday, so make sure you're signing up for something um, for that potluck. Um, because I like to eat. Um, so that's there, and so do you, don't lie. Um, so that's coming up, and then Awana begins on the 11th, and I'll be having some more stuff out for that this week. And then our next board meeting is September the 12th at 6.30. Um, unless there's any other announcements, uh, we will have our special music, and that is the kids, so I'm going to get out of the way.
mind, I know whom I have believed. <laughs>
him in number 359. Jesus is Lord of all. All right, good morning. If you'll take your Bibles uh, to Amos chapter 8 is where we're going to start. So we're going to start with kind of a sword drill, see if you can find Amos and chapter 8, and then we're going to jump to Mark. Um, I saw a couple blank looks on folks' faces when I said Amos, um, but we'll be okay. Amos chapter 8. You'll recall, and while you're turning there, you'll recall we started in in the book of Mark last week, uh, and by start we worked on one verse And and in that verse, we gave ourselves the history of the man who writes the Gospel of Mark, and he is a man who had struggles in life. Uh, He is a man who had gone on a missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas and had um, punched his ticket out of the journey. And because of that, Paul had no more use for him. Barnabas, his cousin, did, and so did others who invested in his life. And as you follow the story of John Mark through the gospel, as you follow his story through uh, the the epistles of Paul and Peter, he is one who ends up being one mightily used by the Lord. And in fact, as he pens the gospel of Mark, is doing so under the auspices or uh, recounting what the apostle Peter had said about Christ. And so uh, the one who had been seemed or deemed as useless by the Apostle Paul later in life would be deemed as useful by the Apostle Paul and also used by the Lord. And and, uh, the one thing I didn't share with you last Sunday morning that I I did mention on Sunday night uh, because I had forgotten to tell you on Sunday morning was that church history recounts that this man, this this Mark who writes the gospel, which we'll get to in a minute because you're like, you said go to Amos, but we're talking about Mark. We'll get there. The one who, who writes this gospel and the inspiration of the scripture, who was useless to, a, to Paul for a while, ends up being the one who becomes the bishop of the church in Alexandria, one of the, the largest cities in the world. Um, and we see the importance of um, pouring our lives into people, even if they have failed, because I promise you that I am not the only person in this room who has failed um, and needed another chance. 
And so as we come to Amos chapter 8, as we work our way into that first chapter of Mark, we're going to see some prophecy come to be fulfilled. But we also remember that between the New Testament and Old Testament, Amos chapter 8 and verse 11 happens. And it says this in Amos 8, 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, I will tell you that a famine in general is a bad thing. We don't really deal with famines in the modern world, at least in, in, in the you know, first world. Those are third world problems. And so, you know, you ask people sometimes, you ask, you know, the joke is often you ask a little kid, where does milk come from? And they'll say, what? The store, you know? And I, I, somebody was recounting a story to me the other day, or maybe I read it about somebody who was arguing with a child about where milk came from, and they couldn't win the argument, so they gave up and said, Dylan's is fine, you know? <laughs> and so as a child, I grew up that way. I mean, I grew up in suburban Florida, so we, I, I mean, I didn't see cows ever very often because I lived in suburban Florida, so my parents would say, here's $5, go down to cash and carry, which was two blocks from my house and bring me back some milk and eggs. And so that's where milk and eggs came from. But a famine of food is a problem, but I would submit to you that a famine from the word of the Lord is a greater problem. And so for 400 years, the Israelites would not hear from God. And so as we jump into Mark chapter 1, Mark does not recount a birth narrative for Christ, nor does he recount the birth narrative for John the Baptist. And, and by the way, as we're going to see him called uh, John com coming baptizing, it'd probably be better to call him John the Baptizer, not John the Baptist. Um, granted, I grew up in Baptist churches, so I kind of want to own him as my own, but that's not the same. Uh, but Baptizer is what that word really means, because that's what he's doing. But between John the Baptist and really before his parents had heard from Gabriel, from the word of the Lord, there had been 400 years of silence. And then God will burst onto the scene, this prophet followed by the Messiah. And so that's exactly what we see here in verse 2 of Mark chapter 1. But we'll back up to get verse 1 because we can go one verse back and, and get our context. In the beginning of the gospel, that is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. Now let's just pause there for a second and remind ourselves, for 400 years we've had silence, but then all of a sudden all these prophetic things begin to wind up and be fulfilled. You'll recall we, we went through Matthew in Sunday school and at other times, and one of the things that Matthew likes to do is say, this happened so that it might be fulfilled, which was written. If, if you read the first couple of chapters of Matthew, you're going to run into that statement a lot, okay? Because Matthew's writing to a particular group of people. The group that Mark's writing to, that doesn't really compute for them, so he's not going to worry so much about saying all these prophecies are fulfilled, but he's going to start off with one to show us that God has a plan and purpose in redemptive history, and he is executing that plan and that purpose, which fulfill the things which were spoken more than 400 years ago, because Isaiah has written well more than 400 years before the time of Christ. But what he's going to do here in verse 2 and 3 is he's going to mash up a bunch of different prophecies into one. Because if you look at your, your footnotes or your cross-references, you'll see Malachi, you'll see uh, Deuteronomy or Exodus, and you will see Isaiah chapter 40. Because he's going to, and this was common in, in the ancient world, that, that they would take the things and kind of put them together to say this is what he's saying because it is what he's saying. So prior to the coming of the Messiah, in verse 2, Behold, I will send my messenger before your, your face, or my angel before your face. That word messenger can be translated angel, which comes back to us from when Moses is, is, is being told that God will not go with the people into the promised land because of their sin. And he says, if you don't go with us, I'm not going, because he has said, I will send my messenger, my angel before you. And we have that great discussion between Moses and the Lord, and the Lord goes with them. But also we see that he will prepare your way before you. John the Baptist had one simple task, and that was to point people to Christ. I mean, the job description was pretty good, I think, pretty simple. I don't know if you've ever applied for a job, and you look at things, and it's like, okay, so here's your job description. You're going to do this, you're going to do this, and you're going to do other duties as assigned. Some of you have enjoyed other duties as assigned because you know, it just means whatever I want you to do. But John's main title, or his main job description, was you're going to go and turn the hearts of the people back to the Lord so that when Christ shows up, they'll be ready to receive him. I've told you many times that I liken John to that guy that you see in larger cities who's outside on the curb with the giant arrow thing spinning it around and pointing it at the business. That's his job. 
to point at Christ. And, and by the way, I think that's our job as well, to point people to Christ. But what is his job, verse 3? To prepare the way of the Lord, the voice, crying of one, uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Put your, your finger there for a second and just jump back to Isaiah 40 because that's where that direct quote comes from. I can't talk about Isaiah 40 with making a plug. Isaiah 40, we're familiar with uh, verses 30 and 31, maybe back to verse 29. Many of you have seen it on a Bible cover, maybe on a mug, maybe something like that, because we like the end of the chapter, which there's nothing wrong with liking the end of the chapter, which says in verse 29, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Again, makes for a great mug, and it's great truth. But I, I would encourage you, um, you'll have time this afternoon, many of you, read the rest of Isaiah 40, because I, those two verses don't happen if everything between verses, let's say, 9 and following aren't true of who God is. Those verses are built on some things that we are taught about who God is. But that's, I mean, not even one of my points, but it's helpful. But jump back further into Isaiah chapter 40, and we see this. Verse 1, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. Crooked places will be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In the ancient world, when somebody of importance was going to come through... You would do everything you could to get out there and fix the roads because you want them to have a good view of your city. And so you would get out there, and you know, I, I laugh about the potholes that are near my house and all that kind of stuff and how it seems like nobody knows how to fill a pothole. I, mean, I don't know either, so I can't make any judgment. But you, know, you, you think about all the places you've driven on the inner places like that, and, and I know in some of those major cities, some of you live near them where it's just like there's craters in the road. But if the president was going to come through town, you can be sure that they would either avoid the potholes or if there was a city that had some means, whatever, they would fix all the potholes, right, for the president or somebody important. And that's what they would do in the ancient world. That's what it means to make straight, elevate the valleys. They would build bridges. They would do things like that in preparation for the coming of this important one. But do you notice at the end of verse 3 where it says, make straight in the desert a highway for our God? In Isaiah chapter 40, this is a specific reference to the Lord, to God, but in Mark chapter 1, it says, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, referring to what the coming one will say of Christ. So ascribing deity to the Lord, to Christ. And so who is this coming one in Mark chapter 1? Well, it's John. I already gave that away. The Baptist, the baptizing one. And he was in the wilderness preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, as we see in verse 5, everybody is coming out to see him and be baptized by them. And just a brief note on baptism. The, the word here, it, it, baptizo, has to do with being immersed. And that's why we baptize that way. But here, it, what's interesting is while many people baptized in the ancient world, the Jews did not baptize. It was not a common practice for Jews to be baptized. What was common... As far as I know, I'm not, ba I'm not, not Baptist, I'm not Jewish. Um, I haven't done one of those 23andMe or whatever those DNA tests are because it would just say mutt on it, um, and it would just show most of Europe, I think. I don't know. I, I've heard funny stories about people who get results back on those, and I like, I don't know what that means. But that's what it would say. It would, just, it would just be a picture of Europe and say, that's where you're from, Tim, and I'd say, that's what I knew. But if I wanted to convert in the ancient world to Judaism... As a Gentile, I could never be a full Jew and have all the full rights that, that a Jewish person would have as far as going to the temple and where I could go, how far into the temple I could go. Uh, There's the court of the Gentiles that I could go in, but first I had to become a proselyte. And then at some point I would be baptized, uh, which, would, which would symbolize that I was becoming clean, that I was becoming part of the Jewish faith. And so they would baptize Gentiles. They didn't baptize each other. And so the fact that these Jews are going out to hear the message of repentance for sins... 
and being baptized by this man out in the wilderness says something. It says something about both the message that he preached and also about the heart of the people, that they knew that they were in the wrong. They knew they had sin. They knew they had to ultimately deal with that sin. Now, if you keep your finger here and jump back to Matthew chapter 3, we get a little more insight into what is happening out there as he is baptizing. In Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And John is, is we know that John and Jesus are, are very similar in age because we know that the, their mothers were pregnant about the same time, but John's mother was pregnant first and further along. And we know that from the stories in Luke and elsewhere. And so they're both about the same age, and they're both about 30, okay? which at this point to me just seems really young. Okay? So they're out there in the wilderness, sorry, John is out there in the wilderness, this 30-year-old man, and he is crying out, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's greatest point in redemptive history is coming, the coming of the Christ, the coming of the Messiah. This is what they have longed for and looked forward to since the promise in the garden, since Genesis chapter 3 since it's reaffirmation to um, Abraham, since the the covenant with David. All of these dots are being connected by John and saying, God is getting ready to do something amazing. Be ready for it. Verse 4, John himself was clothed clothed in camel's hair, and that doesn't mean that he had the skin of a camel and looked like a fuzzy camel, but that fact they would take the hair of the camel and weave it into thread and then make a garment from it. Um, So just, I I remember as a kid thinking that that would look really weird to have, like, wear camel skins. But the idea was the hair. He had a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. By the way, locust is the one insect that is clean and able to be eaten um, in the Old Testament law. And so a good source of protein. Although, (laughs) you can have the locusts. I'll take the wild honey. Okay? So we know how, when we have the uh, potluck next week, you can have... The crock pot full of locusts, I'll take the wild honey. Matthew records the same thing, that Jesus, sorry, that Jerusalem and all Judea and the region went out to the Jordan, and they were baptized him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. They wanted their heart to be right when the Lord comes. Notice this also. So not only are, are, are just the regular run-of-the-mill people, which I, maybe that's not the best way to describe it, but just the people in general are going out there because they're genuinely curious, what is this man preaching out here in, in, in the wilderness? And he's over by the Jordan River, okay? And he, he's out there preaching, and people begin to come and to see him. But he sees, verse 7, the religious leadership come out to him because they're always curious. Because anytime a crowd is going somewhere that they're not, they say, well, you should come hear us. They're the jealous type. And so they want to know what's happening. And and by the way, and I'm sure you understand this, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not friends. This would almost be like if I told you a group of Democrats and Republicans went out together to go see something. You'd say, well, the enemy of my enemy must be my friend. And what does John the Baptist or the baptizer say to them? He says to them, welcome. So glad you're here. Fill out a card so that we can contact you this week. He says nothing of the sort. He says to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? They understand that with the coming of the Lord is also the coming of judgment. Verse 8, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And so he is, and he is A, pointing out their self-righteousness and that that's not going to cut it your self-righteousness, your view of your righteousness. We can look at Isaiah 64, 6 and elsewhere that we think that, that we are good enough, you know, and, and the story that I always tell is, is the first time I went on a youth group, youth group activity when I was in, going from 6th grade to 7th grade, okay? You've heard this story. It's really sad. And I was real excited to go on my first youth, first, I can't say that word, first youth group activity. Awesome. We went to Celebration Station, okay? They had go-karts and video games. What else could you want as a 7th grade boy, Okay? And I looked forward to the go-karts, because what seventh grade boy doesn't look forward to go-karts? But there was a problem. There was a stick with a line on it. Must be this tall to ride the ride. Chelsea knows the story. Must be this tall to ride the ride. And I thought, I'm going to make it. And I went through the line thinking, I'm going to make it. And I got up to the stick, and you know what happened? I didn't make it. I'm getting sad thinking about it right now. (laughs) 
And so how did I spend the next hour of my first youth group activity? Crying. <laughs> like a tough man that I was. And my favorite moment of sympathy was from one of the older guys in the youth group who came up to me and he patted me on the shoulder and he said, sorry that you can't go on that ride, Tim. And I said, okay. And he said, can I have your ticket? <laughs> <laughs> so I rode with the youth pastor and that was nice. But there's that line that says, you must be this righteous to enter the kingdom of God, to enter heaven. And none of us are tall enough. That's what we're talking about here. Verse 9, and do not think to say to yourself, this is Matthew chapter 3, that we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham, who is, even as Abraham is from these stones. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Don't think that you have the pedigree just in your genetics or your DNA to say that I'm good. Now, so go back to Mark, which we've already covered some of this. Mark chapter 1. They're all coming out there, as we've already seen. He's clothed with the things. He's preaching. Now, notice what he is also preaching in verse 7 of Mark chapter 1. He is preaching the repentance and the nearness of the kingdom, but he is also preaching that Messiah is coming. Verse 7. Therefore he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandals strap, I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. Rabbis and others of the day would say that if you were the follower of somebody, there is nothing that you shouldn't do for them except do their shoes. That was the job of a slave. And no one should have to humble themselves enough to untie somebody else's shoes unless you were a slave. Now, I help coach soccer for small children, and so I feel like I'm tying shoes all the time. Blake and I share a disdain for a certain manufacturer of shoes who's no matter how many times you knot them, they come undone, and the children run around with shoelaces untied on the soccer field. I don't know why they made shoelaces like that, but I don't mind doing that. But then again, those shoes aren't also filthy feet that have been walking around in the dust and the dirt of the Judean countryside. But John is saying, if, if a slave's job is to take care of his master's shoes, and that's not even something a good Jew should do, I'm not even worthy to do that. And this is the one who Jesus said, of, of men, there's never been one more bo been born greater than John the Baptist. And so if John the Baptist is the greatest ever born of men, and he says, I'm not worthy to touch the Lord's feet, what does that tell you? But he is, verse 8, pointing them to what he will do. I indeed baptize you with water. I am helping you prepare your heart for the coming of Christ, understanding your need for repentance and remission of sins. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between John the Baptism and between Jesus. John the Baptist, he's a herald. He is to announce to the people the coming of the Messiah, long-awaited, 400 years of silence, and now loudly proclaiming that which we have longed for is here. Verse 9, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came down from Nazareth of Galilee. And, and by the way, we just need to remember that Nazareth of, of, of Galilee is, is nothing, Ancient historians don't even mention its existence. It's almost like when I tell people, when, when, whenever I go back home and, and I meet people or, or somewhere else, and they say, where are you from? I usually say near Wichita, because if I tell people that I'm from Rose Hill, I mean, I might as well tell them that I'm from Mars, because they're like, that doesn't mean anything. And I say, it's a very lovely town. You should visit sometime. We don't have a hotel, but that's OK. We do have $2 generals. But here comes this man from out of nowhere, so to speak, as far as what you would expect. Where would you expect the Messiah to come from? If you asked a good Jew, they'd probably say, well, they'd read the scriptures and they'd, they'd find some things out. But a lot of them would say, well, I mean, the, the seat of power in, in this area is Jerusalem. It's where the king is. That's where the Pharisees, that's where the Sadducees are. That's where the temple is. He'd surely come from somewhere important like that. You know, I'm always, I'm always impressed when, we, when I drive through, is it southeastern Kansas? Where is Eisenhower from? He's from somewhere in Kansas, right? And I'm always like, man, that guy became the supreme allied commander in World War II. He's from Kansas. And then, what, then he was president, and he was from Kansas. And you say, man, you wouldn't expect that. Well, well we would, because we're from Kansas. But people on the east and west coast say, that's flyover country. 
Nothing good comes from Kansas except for corn and wheat and cotton. But here he comes from Nazareth of Galilee. And by the way, Galilee is also largely Gentile. So it's despised by the majority of the Jews. And he was baptized by John and Jordan. Go back to Matthew chapter 3 because while Mark is moving very quickly through all of these stories of Jesus, it's important for us to understand exactly what's happening there. Because this was even a problem for the early church. Because what did we just say John's baptism was? It was a baptism of repentance for sins. So why is Jesus getting baptized? How many sins has he committed? If he's to be the, the, the true, pure sacrifice, it has to be none. So in Matthew chapter 3, we see this. Then in verse 13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And remember, they're cousins, but we don't know how much interaction they've had in their young lives. Remember, John's parents were, were much older, beyond the years of childbearing, in fact, and his mother was much younger. And so we, we don't know the history of their interconnectivity in their, in their lives. Like, I, I could tell you this. Um, my wife and, and her family, they know each other very well, and their nieces and nephews, and, and we've got many of the Burnhams here, and, and you guys seem to know each other pretty well as far as cousins. I, don't, I can't name, like, the seven cousins I have on my dad's side of the family because we saw them for a couple times when I was a kid, and I haven't seen them in the last 30 years. Were John and Jesus like that? Maybe. We know that John goes out and spends, spends a lot of time in the wilderness. But here in verse 13, he's coming down to his cousin to be baptized by him. And John says, whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't how that works. The, the, the greater baptizes the lesser. And it's not the other way around. Because what did he just say in Mark chapter 1? I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. So why would I baptize him? It doesn't compute. And by the way, the baptism is a baptism of repentance. And he has nothing to repent of. He's been pointing to the, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And so John, verse 14 of Matthew 3, tries to prevent him by saying, I need you to baptize me. Which is true. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Now, many scholars think very different thoughts about what this means. Permitted to be thus to fulfill all righteousness that Jesus says, I think the easiest and probably the simplest answer is that this was, as you look at the life of Jesus and you look at him throughout the Gospels, he always does what the Father has him to do and never deviates, complete obedience. And so in part, his baptism is to show John who the Messiah is and also is to show Christ's obedience to the will of the Father. And so he baptized him. And we have in Matthew and in Mark, that when if you go, jump back to Mark real quick, real quick, in verse 10, when he is baptized in the Jordan, immediately coming up from the water, and that means as he, is, he, as, he is, as he is coming up from the water, not walking out of the water, as he is coming up from under the water, he saw the heavens parting. And by the way, if you have a different translation, the idea there is that the heavens are torn apart. Not just like the gentle clouds slowly go like this and a ray of sun comes down. That's not the idea behind that word. It's torn apart. If you go to the very end of, of Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter 15, you see the same term. The only other time in the New Testament we have this same Greek word, and it says this, after Jesus dies on the cross, in verse 38, verse 37, Jesus cries with a loud voice and he breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. His ministry begins with the tearing of the heavens, and it ends with the tearing of the veil. In both cases, these indicate access to the Father. And so his ministry begins with that tearing and will end with another tearing. And then you have a voice, oh, sorry, verse 10, I was getting too excited. He saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. John see the, sees this, and as well as Jesus sees this, we go back to Matthew chapter 3, and probably others saw it as well. We see the same thing there, and we see this also in John. The heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove, alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. If you jump over to John in chapter 1, I believe it is, We'll see uh, from the Baptist perspective, John the Baptist, not theologically Baptists. Verse 20, 
9, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Remember, physically speaking, John the Baptist was born first, but he is indicating his deity. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him. And I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with, with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, this is him who you've been shown to point to. That's my paraphrase. So as we go back to that thought of Matthew chapter 3, the idea to fulfill all righteousness is to both demonstrate to John the Baptist that this is the Messiah and to demonstrate Christ's obedience to the will of the Father. So back to Mark chapter 1. I'm sorry I'm making you flip all over this morning, but it's okay. You'll notice also in the baptism of John, this is a very Trinitarian event. You have God the Father, you have God the Son, and you have God the Holy Spirit, all involved in redemptive history in general, and specifically at the coronation of the king, if you will, at the beginning of his ministry on earth. Jesus' ministry will be done through the power of the Spirit, in obedience to the will of the Father, all the way through. But notice verse 11. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. This is before Christ begins his active ministry at the very, very beginning, but he is still declared to be the son of God in whom he is well pleased. Permit me one of many more turns. Genesis chapter 22. He is the beloved son of the Father. John 3.16, of course, tells us that he is the only begotten. The idea there doesn't just mean that he is an only child, as sometimes I used to think of that as a child, as a kid, but it means he is unique in his relation to the Father. Monogenes. In Genesis chapter 22, we have a very familiar story of Abraham and Isaac and the testing of Abraham's faith. And it says this in, in verse 1 of chapter 22. It came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he, that is God, said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this is the same terminology that we have in Mark chapter 1. Your beloved and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. Remember, Abraham has been waiting for this promise to come to pass that God has said, and we looked at this in Sunday school this morning a little bit, that, that I'm going to make a nation out of you. That if somebody could number the sands of the sea, or of, of the beach of the sea, that that would be like your descendants. And this is the one through whom the promise goes. And God says, go kill him. Offer him as a sacrifice. Now, I have five children. I love all of them. I don't want to sacrifice any of them. Right? That's your, that's your gut reaction as a parent, isn't it? We know from Hebrews that Abraham, his view on this was, God promised this child, my wife was barren, there's no way she could have had this child and, and given me a child of promise, so God must have had it all worked out in the end that he would raise him from the dead. So he's like, God, I was, my body was as good as dead when you gave me this child. If I kill this child, then you're going to raise him from the dead because he's the son of promise. So I'm going to trust you. That's the thought process here. As we go forward into verse 9, they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order that Isaac had carried. I'm of the opinion that Isaac is at least a teenager, maybe in his 20s, maybe even as old as 30. Okay? Now, I don't know about you. I'm 40. My dad is 70. I, I think that I could probably take him. Maybe. We had one skirmish when I was younger. This is a funny story. He thought he was going to scare me, and I was probably like 12 maybe 10. And so he, I was in the front yard, and he came around the side of the yard, and he was going to sneak up on me and scare me. And so he did. But I was the white belt champion in my dojo in Taekwondo when I was in like the third grade. And so as he scared me, I dropped to the ground, and Karate Kid tried to sweep the leg. And he had to jump over me for his own safety. I'm just saying. But he has more guns than I do, so we'll leave that alone. All I'm saying is that Isaac is okay with what's happening at least. He trusts his father. That's the point. I trust my father implicitly. 
Most of you probably trust your parents implicitly as well. I don't know. I trust mine. He bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abram stretched, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Again, Hebrews 11 reminds us of exactly what's going through his mind, that this is the son of promise. My body was as good as dead. You gave me this child. Therefore, you must have the ability to do whatever you need to do to continue this promise. So I trust you, as he says to the Lord in his heart. And as he stretches out his hand to take the knife to slay his son, an angel, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he says, do not lay your hand to the ladder. Do anything to him. For I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, that son of the promise from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes, and he sees the ram, and he took the ram, verse 13, and offered him as a sacrifice instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. Jump back to Mark chapter 1. I mean, this part of, of the message almost writes itself, I think, doesn't it? The Lord will provide. Abraham taking Isaac, his only son, the son of the promise, his beloved, and holding the knife up, and God saving, if you will. But what do we see in, the, in, in God? That he will provide for you and I through the death of his beloved. And we see the obedience of Christ, much like Isaac, willing to die. Therefore, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The father knows Christ's obedience. Never a doubt that Christ will obey and that he will obey completely. So as we wrap up this morning, what a beautiful picture for us of commitment. We think of, of Abraham's commitment to do whatever it is that God has called him to do. I don't think God's going to ask any of us to take our children up onto a mountain and sacrifice them. But what are we willing to commit to the Lord? We see the commitment of both God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son in redemptive history. Jesus knows before he goes to be baptized that he's going to be baptized, he's going to the cross. Complete obedience. The Father knows in sending the Son that he will suffer. How hard would it be for you to send your child to suffer? But we see complete obedience in the providential care of God for his people. Just as Abraham had named that place, God will provide, that is prophetic in the sense that God has provided for us in Christ. He has provided in preparing his people in John the Baptist, making their hearts ready for the coming of Christ. But we'll see as we go that even as Jesus arrives in verse 17, I'm sorry, verse 15, preaching the coming of the kingdom, they will ultimately reject. And so I would encourage us to think and to ponder this morning about the, the promises and faithfulness of God to us. We don't know what God's timetable is going to be. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, when he declared the famine of words that were coming, the people of Israel didn't know it would be 400 years. But God works on his timetable, not on my timetable. Remember, we, we live in the Amazon Prime world where you order something and you get it in two days, otherwise you get irritated. We live in a TikTok generation where if you can't give me information in 15 seconds, I move on to the next thing. God works at the speed God works at for his plans and purposes and for his glory, not mine. So we must be content to find our rest in that. But back in verse 8, we also see a beautiful thing. John declares that he baptizes with water, but Jesus will come and baptize you with a spirit. As Jesus is preparing his disciples in John in that farewell discourse for his departure, he reminds them that even though it hurts for them to go away, it is better because they will have what? The spirit. The same spirit which empowered Christ's ministry is a spirit which would be in them and in us to empower us to live in the world that we are in for the service of the Lord, in good times and in bad. The Spirit will be with us. We will not be alone. And in fact, as you, as you move through all of the epistles in the New Testament, we see that not only does the Spirit empower us, but Christ dwells in us. 
and the Father works in us. The, the, the very Trinitarian essence of the mission of Christ is a Trinitarian theology of God working in our hearts and lives as well. And so we derive great comfort from that. And lastly, I would remind us that God desires and God demands our obedience as his children. You and I will not be capable of complete and total obedience like Christ was because I'm not Christ. I have failed this morning. I will fail this afternoon. I will fail tomorrow. But his desire is that we would be Christ-like, and he has given us all that we need for that. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we have looked at a few short verses in Mark and in Matthew and John and elsewhere, and we, we could have looked at many others. But we thank you as we look through the passage of Scripture, we see your faithfulness. Even in dark times and in hard times, as we think about Abraham riding out to a mountain, all the while knowing what his job and his task is to, but at the same time, while he rides to a difficult task, he has complete trust. Where we think of John the Baptist coming, whose, whose job was not easy to point out sin. And we know that he ends up paying the price for pointing out that sin with his life. And John the Baptist is a person who struggled also. But Lord, help us to understand our need for remission of sins, our need for salvation, our need for the gospel, because without the gospel, we are hopeless. Lord, thank you also as we see here in verse 8 that, that those that have put their faith in Christ will have the Holy Spirit as well to empower us to live a life that we ought to, that would be pleasing to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for this privilege of being in your house today. We thank you for the message you've given. We pray that we might ever be thankful for all that you did on the cross of Calvary, that we might have life through you. We thank you for all that are in attendance. We pray that all might have received the blessing from the word and that we might take it with us to be witnesses and testimony to your saving grace to those who know and who we come in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray.